This is Space Time Series 20, Episode 55. Coming up on Space Time. New mysteries surrounding New Horizons' next flyby target. The first ever supermassive black hole binary discovered. And Earth's magnetic field reveals one of its secrets. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA's New Horizons spacecraft won't be reaching its next target until January the 1st, 2019. But the Kuiper Belt Object 2014 MU69 is already revealing some surprises. The unexpected findings have come while scientists were sifting through data gathered from observing MU69's transit or occultation in front of a distant star. The event, which occurred on June 3rd, saw more than 50 mission team members and collaborators set up telescopes across South Africa and Argentina along the predicted track of the occultation, hoping to catch a two-second glimpse of the event. Accomplishing the observations of that occultation was made possible with the help of NASA's Hubble Space Telescope and the European Space Agency's Gaia Space Observatory. Combined, the telescopes captured more than 100,000 images of the occultation star. They can be used to assess the environment around MU69, which is some 1.6 billion kilometres beyond Pluto. And the data has provided some valuable and unexpected insights. Occultation team leader Mark Pugh from the New Horizons Science team at the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado, says the data shows MU69 might not be as dark or as large as some expected. Initial estimates of MU69's diameter, based primarily on data taken by the Hubble Space Telescope since the Kuiper Belt object's discovery in 2014, indicated it was between 20 and 40 kilometres in diameter. However, the new occultation data indicates MU69 could actually be less than 20 kilometres wide. Besides MU69's size, the readings offer new details on other aspects of this Kuiper Belt object. New Horizons principal investigator Alan Stern, who's also from the Southwest Research Institute, says the new findings are telling scientists something really interesting. The fact that astronomers accomplished the occultation observations from every planet observing site, but still didn't actually detect MU69 itself, could mean that it's either very highly reflective or it's an awful lot smaller than expected. In fact, it may actually be a binary system, two lumps of space rock orbiting each other. Alternatively, it could be a swarm of smaller bodies left over from the time when the planets first formed 4.6 billion years ago. More data is now being gathered by Stern, who's flying aboard NASA's SOFIA, the Airborne Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy Aircraft, a specially modified Boeing 747SP fitted with a side-mounted 2.5-metre telescope. SOFIA, which is currently flying out of New Zealand, is probing the space around MU69 for debris, which could present a hazard for the New Horizons spacecraft when it flies by the object in 18 months' time. Earlier Hubble Space Telescope data suggested MU69 was as red, if not redder, than Pluto, and next week the Hubble Space Telescope will again check for debris around MU69, while team members set up another ground-based fence line of small mobile telescopes along the predicted ground track of another occultation shadow, this one in southern Argentina, and hopefully aiming to better constrain or even determine the exact size and constituency of MU69 itself. As for the New Horizons spacecraft itself, it's currently in hibernation mode as it continues its journey through the dark outer reaches of the solar system beyond Pluto. Mission managers at Johns Hopkins University in Laurel, Maryland, put the probe to sleep back in April and don't expect to awaken it again until September the 11th. The spacecraft, which undertook the first ever close-up visit to the Pluto system in July 2015, is now more than 6 billion kilometres from Earth. It took New Horizons more than 16 months to send back all the data gathered during that historic Pluto flyby. You see, at that distance, radio commands take over five hours to reach the probe and then another five hours to get back to the dishes of NASA's Deep Space Communications Network. Mission managers are currently still developing detailed command loads for the MU69 encounter. They'll shape the science observations for much of the nine-day flyby. Meanwhile, the final streams of data from that historic Pluto flyby show that the 2,400-kilometre-wide dwarf planet appears to be mostly cloud-free. However, a few wispy cloud patches were detected, indicating weather on Pluto could be far more complex than previously thought. 
New Horizons also confirm that Pluto's icy surface below that atmosphere varied widely in brightness. The new data also shows the brightest areas in places such as sections of Pluto's large heart-shaped region are among the most reflective in the solar system, and of course that must be indicating recent surface activity of some sort. While Pluto shows many different kinds of activity, one surface process apparently missing are landslides. Surprisingly though, landslides were spotted on Pluto's binary partner Charon. The 1,200km wide moon displays similar landslides as those seen in other rocky and icy worlds such as Mars and Saturn's moon Iapetus. But these were the first landslides seen so far from the Sun and in the Kuiper Belt. The big question is, will they also be detected elsewhere in the Kuiper Belt? Both Hubble and cameras aboard New Horizons spacecraft have been aimed at the Kuiper Belt over the past few years, with New Horizons taking advantage of its unique vantage point to observe at least a dozen small worlds in this barely explored region. So far, MU69 is the smallest Kuiper Belt object to have its colour measured. And scientists have used that data to confirm that the object is part of the so-called cold classical region of the Kuiper Belt, which is believed to contain some of the oldest, most prehistoric material in the solar system. It means when New Horizons reaches MU69 on New Year's Day 2019, it'll be looking at the solar system's most ancient planetary building blocks. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. Astronomers have for the first time ever discovered two supermassive black holes orbiting each other in a single galaxy. The study, reported in the Astrophysical Journal, claims the new detection will provide new clues to astronomers about the process of galaxy mergers and galaxy evolution. You see, galaxies grow by merging or cannibalising each other. For example, right now our own galaxy, the Milky Way, is stripping a steady stream of stars and gas from two neighbouring satellite galaxies, the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds. It's also cannibalising at least one other galaxy we know of, the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy, and will itself soon be absorbed into the even larger Andromeda Galaxy M31 in about 3.7 billion years from now. Almost all galaxies are thought to contain a central supermassive black hole, millions to billions of times the mass of our Sun. The one at the centre of the Milky Way, Sagittarius A star, is some 27,000 light years from Earth and contains some 4.3 million times the mass of our Sun. Astronomers want to better understand how these central supermassive black holes react as their surrounding galaxies merge, how the supermassive black holes themselves merge, and how that affects the evolution of the galaxy around them. And in order to try and achieve this goal, scientists have been searching the heavens for pairs of supermassive black holes in close orbits around each other, a sign that the galaxy has undergone a merger in recent astronomical time. Since 2003, astronomers using the Very Large Array Radio Telescope in New Mexico, the one made famous in the movie Contact, have been monitoring the distant elliptical radio galaxy 0402 plus 379, which is located some 750 million light years away. Elliptical galaxies are thought to form out of galactic mergers. And radio galaxies are so called because of their strong radio signals generated by an active galactic nuclei. In other words, a feeding supermassive black hole. The authors detected what appear to be a pair of supermassive black holes orbiting each other near the very heart of this galaxy. One of the study's authors, Professor Greg Taylor from the University of New Mexico, says even though astronomers have theorised that this is what should be happening during a merger, no one's actually ever seen it until now. And what a sight it is. The two black holes are truly huge, with a combined mass some 15 billion times that of our Sun and that makes them among the biggest black holes ever detected. They're currently orbiting each other every 30,000 Earth years at an average distance of about 22 light years, making them the closest supermassive black holes to each other ever seen. And the superlatives don't end there. From Earth, the pair appear to be moving across the sky at a rate of just over a micro arc second per year. That's an angle about a billion times smaller than the smallest thing visible with the unaided human eye. Therefore, if confirmed, their detection will also be one of the smallest ever recorded movements of an object across the sky. Mind you, don't expect anything too quickly. It's not like you need to set up your gravitational wave detectors tomorrow to get ready for the coming gravity waves. Based on their current orbital speed and distance, this supermassive black hole binary is still too far apart to merge anytime soon. To find out more, 
Andrew Dunkley speaking with Dr Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory. They've been looking for this phenomenon for a very long time. Indeed they have and now they've found it. So these are observations made with an array of radio telescopes which is situated in New Mexico. It's called the Very Large Array, the VLA. The VLA is capable because it's a, a gigantic array of radio telescopes, as I said, situated in New Mexico. It's capable of resolving or probing fine details detail in space, almost second to no other facility in the world. And that's because by separating these various radio antennae, you can actually probe very finely what's going on in the depths of the universe. So the astronomers conducting this research have basically locked onto a radio galaxy with the eloquent name of 0402 plus 379. Nice. Which, yes, it's a nice one, yeah. (laughs) So what the gentlemen and ladies of the University of New Mexico have been doing is using this very large array to look at this galaxy in fine detail. And they've detected evidence of black holes. Now, black holes don't shine. They're black. But what they do is they gather material around them, which basically is being swallowed up. It doesn't just sort of go straight down. It basically swirls around the black holes in a thing we call the accretion disk. It's because the black hole is accreting or collecting material. And the accretion disk is a very high energy part of the universe because all this stuff is banging into its neighbours, jostling along, and it actually emits radiation at quite a range of wavelengths, including X-rays and infrared rays and radio waves, which are what have been picked up. So two black holes detected in the center of one galaxy Mm. and that is the smoking gun for this galaxy having grown to its present size by emerging with another galaxy we think all galaxies have a supermassive black hole at their center ours has one there's an accretion disk around it and that's all very well behaved because it's so far away but in this case these two black holes have a combined mass of 15 billion times that of the sun wow so they are actually right at the upper range of of these this species of objects, supermassive black holes. So the fact that there are two of them kind of points towards the idea that there has been a merger between two galaxies. And what we're seeing is the that the sort of end product of that merger, and that is two black holes gradually spiraling around one another until they eventually coalesce. I was We've going to about, ask you if they if they will combine or collide or whatever it is they're going to do. They will, but apparently they're moving so slowly at the moment that the estimated time to that coalescence is something like three times the present age of the universe, which, oh. by which time people tend to have lost interest yeah. in this kind of thing. How do they know that they're swirling around one another? That's the trick and that's the key to this research. And it's what makes it such a stunning piece of astronomy. The resolution of this radio array, by that I mean its ability to pinpoint fine detail, it's such that they've actually detected the motion of one black hole relative to the other. Uh-huh. Um, uh, they're measuring changes in angle of something like a millionth of an arc second per year. Now, an arc second is the angle that a $1 coin subtends at your eye if you hold it up five kilometres away. So you get somebody to hold a coin up, a $1 coin, and you're five kilometres away from it. The angle that that coin makes in your eye is one arc second. But these guys are detecting one millionth of that amount in order to measure the motion, the relative motion of these black holes. It is a triumphant piece of research, and it's really quite quite remarkable that we've been seeing merging black holes now at two completely different scales. The gravitational wave observations that so far have revealed three black hole collisions, three merging black holes, and now we're seeing one that is on a much different scale. The two black holes are nowhere near each other, they're nowhere near merging. But it tells us that it's a fairly common phenomenon throughout the universe, that probably the centres of many galaxies have more than one black hole. So you can be sure that the VLA, the Very Large Array, will be casting its electronic eyes heavenwards looking for more of these things. And uh, no doubt uh, here on Space Nuts, we'll talk about them. Yes, I hope so. And for those who uh, don't know how big an Australian $1 coin is, it's about the size of a US quarter, just so you know. So you can do that experiment. Or about the size of a UK pound. There you are. There you are. Pound Very coin. Good. It's about the same. That's Dr. Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. (music) 
Scientists have identified previously unknown patterns in Earth's magnetic field which appear to evolve over timescales on the order of a thousand years. The pattern, known as paleomagnetic secular variation, provides new insights into how the planetary magnetic field works by adding a measure of predictability into changes in the field not previously known. A report in the Journal of Earth and Planetary Science Letters claims the discovery could mean Earth's magnetic field may be far simpler than previously thought. The discovery will also allow scientists to study the Earth's past with far greater resolution by using this geomagnetic fingerprint to compare sedimentary cores taken from the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. The Earth's magnetic field is generated by the planet's liquid outer core of iron, nickel and other metals which create electric currents that in turn produce magnetic fields. This geomagnetic field is critical for the survival of life on Earth. Without it, charged particles from the Sun, known as the solar wind, would erode away Earth's thick protective atmosphere. That's what happened on Mars billions of years ago when its magnetic field shut down, turning the red planet from a warm, wet world with oceans and rivers, once suitable for life as we know it, into the barren, freeze-dried desert it is today. The magnetic field also protects the Earth from the majority of the solar and cosmic radiation which constantly bombards the planet. It provides the framework for those spectacular auroral displays of the northern and southern lights which are seen at higher latitudes. And it acts as a vital aid for both animal migrations and human navigation. Centuries of human observation as well as the geologic record show that our planet's magnetic field changes dramatically in its strength and structure over time. Yet in spite of its importance, many questions remain unanswered about why and how these changes occur. The simplest form of magnetic field emanates from a dipole, a pair of equally and oppositely charged poles like a bar magnet. However, the study's lead author Maureen Walzak from Oregon State University says scientists have known for some time that the Earth isn't a perfect dipole, and researchers can see these imperfections in the geologic record. Walzak says scientists are finding out that non-dipole structures are not even sent unpredictable things. Instead, they're very long-lived, recurring over 10,000 years, and persistent in their location throughout the Holocene. The authors describe these non-dipolar structures as something of a holy grail discovery, though not perfect. Still, it's an important first step in better understanding the magnetic field and synchronising sedimentary core data at a finer scale. Some 800,000 years ago, a magnetic compass needle would have pointed south because Earth's magnetic field was reversed. And we now know that Earth's magnetic poles flip at regular intervals every 200,000 to 300,000 years. However, with the last occurring over 780,000 years ago, it means we're already well overdue for the next polarity reversal. A strange geomagnetic feature off the Argentinian coast known as the South Atlantic Anomaly, which appears to have a northern polarity, may be the first signs of this long-awaited pole reversal. The anomaly is a major geomagnetic feature of this planet. In fact, Earth's Van Allen radiation belts are affected above the South Atlantic Anomaly, dropping closer to the planet's surface than at any other location. And that leads to an increased flux of energetic particles in this region, exposing spacecraft to higher than usual levels of radiation. In fact, NASA even shuts down Hubble Space Telescope operations to take account of this anomaly when orbiting above it. While scientists are well aware of the pattern of reversals in Earth's magnetic field, the newly discovered secondary pattern of geomagnetic wobble within periods of stable polarity, known as paleomagnetic secular variation, or PSV, may be key to understanding why some geomagnetic changes occur. Earth's magnetic field doesn't align perfectly with the axis of rotation, which is why true north differs from magnetic north. And this change is constant, as any pilot will tell you, every day they've got to readjust their magnetic compass to take account for this change. Earth's magnetic north pole has slowly been creeping northwards by more than about 1,100 kilometres since the early 19th century when explorers first located it precisely. And interestingly, it's now starting to move faster, with scientists measuring it migrating northwards at about 75 kilometres per year, which is four times faster than what it was doing in the early 20th century. In the Northern Hemisphere, this disparity between North Magnetic Pole and True North is apparently driven by regions of high geomagnetic intensity that are centred beneath North America and Asia. However, until now, scientists hadn't known if this snapshot had any sort of longer-term meaning. This new study shows that it does. When the magnetic field is stronger beneath North America, placing it in what scientists call the North American mode, it drives steep inclinations and high intensities in the North Pacific, and lower intensities in Europe with westward declinations in the North Atlantic. This is more consistent with a historical record. 
The alternative European mode is in some ways the exact opposite, with shallow inclination and low intensity in the North Pacific and eastward declinations in the North Atlantic with higher intensities in Europe. It all means the magnetic field may be somewhat less complicated than scientists thought. It seems to be a fairly simple oscillation, which seems to result from geomagnetic intensity variations at just a few recurrent locations with large spatial impacts. Like with much of science's understanding of Earth's magnetic field and the geodynamo which generates it, scientists still don't know what's driving this variation. They think it's likely to be a combination of factors, including convection in the outer liquid core, which may be biased in configuration by the lowermost mantle. The authors identify this pattern by studying two high-resolution sedimentary cores from the Gulf of Alaska that allowed them to develop a 17,400-year reconstruction of the paleomagnetic secular variation in that region. They then compared those records with sedimentary cores from other sites across the Pacific Ocean in order to capture a magnetic fingerprint. These magnetic fingerprints are based on the orientation of magnetite within sediment which act as magnetic recorders of the past. The common magnetic signal found in the cores now covers an area spanning from Alaska to Oregon and over to Hawaii. Waltzak says the magnetic alignment of distant environmental reconstructions using reversals in the paleomagnetic record are providing new insights into the past on a scale of hundreds of thousands of years. Development of the coherent paleomagnetic secular variation stratigraphy will allow scientists to look at this record on a scale possibly as short as just a few centuries means they'll be able to compare events between ocean basins and even get down to the nitty-gritty of how climate anomalies are propagated around the planet on a scale relevant to human society. The fact that the Earth's magnetic field changes is well known, but the reasons why have remained a mystery. Now this mystery may be a little closer to getting solved. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Last time on Space Time, we looked at the very busy launch schedule for SpaceX and its Falcon 9 rocket, with no less than four launches in the space of less than a month. Well, not to be outdone, the Russian Soyuz workhorse has also had a very busy few months. It all began in late April with the launch of two Expedition 52 crew members bound for the International Space Station aboard the Soyuz MS-04 capsule from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in the Central Asian Republic of Kazakhstan. The flight was launched from the same pad used by Yuri Gagarin for the first human voyage into space way back in April 1961. Vehicle to internal power. There's the call of the vehicle now on internal power, the first umbilical tower separating from the booster. And there's the second umbilical separating, the engine starting to ramp up. The engine's firing, now building up to flight speed and liftoff. Jack Fisher and Fyodor Yurchikin on their way to the International Space Station. Vehicles clear the tower, getting good first stage performance. That's so used to delivering about 930,000 pounds of thrust from those four strap-on engines in the core. Getting good performance calls, nominal or normal so far for the first stage, continuing to operate well. Again, a pretty clear day there in Baikonur, so getting great views of the rocket as it flies across the Kazakh sky. 60 seconds. And uh, roll page your uh, on hill. The crew is feeling good. The vehicle already moving at over 1,100 miles an hour. And continuing to get those good performance calls, you'll hear yaw, pitch, and roll, basically the orientation of the rocket. Want to hear nominal, and that's what we're hearing. Everything going well with the Soyuz so far. And we've gotten confirmation that the escape tower has been jettisoned and the first stage has been jettisoned. Again, those four strap-on boosters have completed their job, dropped away. The vehicle already in an altitude of about 28 statute miles. Soyuz rocket traveling at about 3,350 miles an hour. 
Thumbs up from Jack Fisher. Everything continuing to go great so far with this launch. The vehicle under the power now of the core stage or the second stage, and that's going to continue to fire until about four minutes and 48 seconds into the flight. Second stage thrusters are operating nominally. Getting confirmation the launch shroud has been jettisoned, so the Soyuz vehicle now exposed. Everything going right per the timeline so far with today's launch. Second stage continuing to perform great uh, from all the reports coming in. Just past the three-minute mark since liftoff. At this point, the Soyuz already traveling over 4,700 miles per hour. Second stage thrusters are operating. Everything performing as expected. That core stage of the Soyuz, 56 feet in length, 13 and a half in diameter, has a single engine with four fuel chambers and provides between 178,000 and 222,000 pounds of thrust, depending on the altitude of the vehicle. And it burns for about three minutes and 28 seconds. It's going to burn until the four minute 43 second mark, and then it'll use uh, what's known as a hot stage technique. So the third stage will actually ignite while the second's still burning. That's why, again, the Soyuz rocket has that open lattice-like structure in between the second and third stages. Continuing to get good calls, four minutes, 12 seconds in counting since liftoff. 260 seconds. Parameters are nominal. Just got confirmation the second stage separated from the Soyuz rocket, the third stage firing. We have separation of the second stage. Yes, we confirm. And confirmation the third stage engine has ignited and now powering the Soyuz into its preliminary orbit. That core booster separates at an altitude of about 105 miles. And the Soyuz now propelled by the single engine of the Soyuz's third stage, providing about 67,000 pounds of thrust and is going to burn for the next four minutes and two seconds. Third stage thrusters operating nominally. YPR normal. SR pressure is 782. The crew is feeling good. Copy. Getting reports. The crew feeling good. Everything continuing to go great again. The Soyuz's third stage now powering it. 390 seconds. It's going to continue to operate until 8 minutes and 45 seconds post liftoff. So another two minutes uh, under the third stage, and then the rocket's job will be done, and the spacecraft will be in its preliminary orbit. Again, all the calls, everything going well so far with this morning's launch vehicle traveling in excess of 13,500 miles an hour. And again, as a reminder, once they are delivered into orbit, a series of commands that are pre-programmed will execute, and all of the antennas will deploy along with the solar arrays. Stabilization, nominal. The third stage should be cutting off. And the third stage has cut off and separated. The Soyuz FG launch vehicle was flown on a six-hour fast rendezvous trajectory to the space station, cutting two days off the normal journey time. The lower than usual two-person flight crew is part of a decision by the Russian Federal Space Agency, Roscosmos, to cut down the number of participating Russian cosmonauts aboard the orbiting outpost. Then in May, Ariane Space launched the Soyuz 21A rocket from the European Space Agency's Kourou spaceport in French Guiana, carrying the SES-15 telecommunications satellite into geostationary orbit. A tous deux DDO, attention pour le début de la séquence d'allumage du lanceur. Top à 0 moins 20 secondes. Largage du main VKM. Allumage triétage. Attention pour le décompte final. 10, 9, 8, 7. 15 has begun its long journey. Raymond Boyce, the range operations manager, is telling us that everything. It's going according to plan. Les paramètres sont nominaux. Everything's normal. We're heading east. That's unusual for Soyuz. Normally it goes north. We're going east today because we're carrying a satellite headed to geostationary orbit. And we are coming up now to the scheduled moment when we jettison the boosters. That's all been confirmed now. So we're burning the main core stage. It's going to burn for about three more minutes. Altitude. 
81 kilometers above the earth and climbing. We're heading towards the Kármán line. That's the border between space and our atmosphere. It's where the atmosphere becomes so thin that it can no longer support vehicles with wings. So it's where aeronautics ends and astronautics begins. The top of the vehicle, the nose, that's called the fairing. The satellite is inside there. And it's been protecting the satellite from the rigors of the launch so far. So from the acoustic vibrations at liftoff, it's very loud, you can just imagine. And also from friction, because we have been traveling through the dense part of the atmosphere. But now the atmosphere is so thin that we don't need it anymore. It's able to be jettisoned. Separation coif. And that's separation of the fairings being confirmed. Distance from the pad, 432 kilometers. That's if you were to draw a straight line along the Earth from the pad. This is the scheduled separation now of the second stage and ignition of the third stage. Those parts... And he's confirmed that. Soyuz has uh, what's called, or uses rather, a hot stage technique, which means that it's, it switches on the third stage engine before switching off the second stage. A word about our confirmations. We get our actual confirmations of those milestones just fractionally later. That's because it uh, takes the information a little bit of time to get to the range operations manager here at the Guiana Space Center from the launcher. And that's because it goes via Moscow, where it's validated before coming to the Tous launch control center here at the CSG, CSG being the Guiana Space Center. He's telling us that everything is going nominally. Our speed 4.63 kilometers per second. And we left the pad from the northeastern corner of South America. We lifted off 6 minutes and 46 seconds ago from the pad. Natal, and he's telling us that we have now picked up the signal at the Natal tracking station. It's on the northeastern coast of Brazil. The Soyuz used for Ariane spaceflight VS-17 was equipped with a frigate empty upper stage programmed with a new timing for the frigate's second engine burn firing. Designed to shave several weeks off the time it will take to transition the SES-15 spacecraft into service. Built by Boeing on a 702 SP satellite platform, the 2,302 kg spacecraft is the first satellite launched for the Luxembourg-based company using a Soyuz rocket to get to geostationary orbit. The SES-15 is a hybrid fitted with an additional 16 KU band wide beam transponders as well as KU and KA band high throughput satellite capabilities serving North America, Mexico, Central America and the Caribbean. The satellite will provide in-flight Wi-Fi and entertainment services for commercial airline passengers, as well as specialist communication services for government and maritime networks. SES-15 is also carrying a Ratheon Wide Area Augmentation System hosted payload, which will enable the US Federal Aviation Administration to augment the Global Positioning Satellite System to improve aircraft navigation accuracy. Instead of conventional hydrazine fuel, the satellite's powered by a Xeon electric propulsion system for orbit raising and in-orbit maneuvers. That means instead of lasting about 12 to 15 years, it could still be operational for at least 18 years. Just a week after the Ariane space launch, the Russian Federal Space Agency Roscosmos launched the Soyuz 21B rocket from the Plesetsk Cosmodrome 800 kilometers north of Moscow, carrying a new missile early warning defense system EKS-2 satellite. The flight was the first launch from the remote Plesetsk missile range in over a year. The new EKS satellites, codenamed Tundra, are replacing the Soviet-era OKO early warning system. The Russian military is planning a constellation of eight EKS satellites. All will be placed in highly elliptical Molnya orbits, which are designed to keep the spacecraft flying over polar regions for an extended period of time. The new EKS satellites are equipped with infrared sensors designed to detect heat sources, such as missile exhaust plumes. They're also fitted with optical and ultraviolet sensors, allowing them to track missiles in flight, providing faster warning times for potential targets. The launch sparked excitement in Tasmania with reports of UFOs seen across the sky. A notice to airmen or notams was issued prior to the launch, indicating that the Soyuz rocket's frigate M upper stage would be re-entering the Earth's atmosphere as space junk south of the Apple Isle. 
The Soyuz glide was broken in June when Russia's previously unreliable Proton rocket made a return to flight status with its first launch in over a year. The year-long grounding has been the longest in the Proton's 52-year history. The launch from the Baikonur Cosmodrome carried the Echo Star 21 telecommunications satellite. Nine hours and 13 minutes after launch, and following five engine burns from the Proton's Brizem upper stage, the Echo Star 21 was successfully placed into its geostationary transfer orbit. Echo Star 21 is designed to provide S-band mobile connectivity across Europe for 15 years. The 6,871kg satellite uses a Space Systems Laurel SSL-1300 satellite platform, optimised to hold a large deployable antenna reflector capable of generating hundreds of communication spot beams to cover a wide area of the planet. The Proton had been grounded following the premature shutdown of the booster's second stage during a flight in June 2016. That mission's Intelsat-31 satellite payload did make it into geostationary transfer orbit. But the incident led Roscosmos to ground the Proton until the cause of the premature shutdown was uncovered. The ensuing investigation has revealed massive quality control problems with the Proton's Russian manufacturers. Then, just as the Proton was about to re-enter service in December last year, a Soyuz U launch vehicle, which is the same upper stage as the Proton, also failed during launch, prompting yet another investigation and further delays. The Proton developed its reputation for unreliability following multiple failures in 2014 and 2015, mostly due to quality control problems. Less than a week after the Proton launch, the Progress MS-06 cargo ship blasted into orbit also from the Baikonur Cosmodrome, carrying fresh supplies to the crew of the International Space Station. The flight launched aboard a Soyuz 21A rocket, replacing the former Soyuz U launch system. Standing by for engine sequence start. T-minus 10 seconds. Ignition. The launch command has now been issued. Engine start underway. Turbo pumps coming up to flight speed. Engine turbo pumps at flight speed. Engines at maximum thrust. And liftoff. Liftoff of the 67th Progress resupply vehicle bound on a two-day journey to the International Space Station. Roll pitch and yaw program in. Booster parameters are all normal. First stage engine functioning normally. Soyuz booster arcing out uh, to the northeast from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Vehicle is stable. Engineers at the blockhouse in Baikonur report all parameters are normal. Good first stage engine. First stage engine shutdown and separation of the first stage coming at 1 minute 57 seconds into the flight. The booster parameters are normal. Booster parameters are normal. Standing by for first stage engine shutdown and first stage separation. Station parameters are normal. Strap-on boosters have uh, separated. The progress docked with the Russian peers module following a conventional two-day rendezvous trajectory. Original plans called for the Progress to take the Piers module with it when it departed the space station in order to make room for Russia's new Nauka docking port. However, ongoing delays with the construction of the Nauka module have now postponed the changeover until at least April 2018, which will be about the time the Progress MS-09 spacecraft arrives. Finally, on June the 23rd, Russia undertook the clandestine launch of a Soyuz 21V rocket from the Plesetsk Cosmodrome carrying a classified military payload. The top-secret satellite was designated 14F-150, and that means it could be the first in the new generation of military geodesy satellites codenamed Voltage. Geodesy satellites measure fine incremental changes in Earth's gravitational field. These variations can be used to fine-tune guidance and targeting systems. Now, if it's not the new Voltage, alternatively, it could be one of the existing GeoIK-2 geodesy satellites, which may have been bumped off its original Rokot launch vehicle schedule. Moscow announced plans to retire the converted SS-19 Stiletto ICBMs after two more flights, and Rokots were already planned to launch two European Space Agency Sentinel spacecraft this year. The Soyuz 21V uses a modified Soyuz 21B core stage, which isn't fitted with the usual four strap-on boosters which give the F-7 and its Soyuz derivatives their stylish and iconic appearance. The Soyuz 21V is only twice flown before, a successful maiden flight back in 2013, and a 2015 mission which failed to deploy its Cosmos 2511 satellite payload. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And that's the show for now. 
You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, your favorite podcast download provider, or direct from Spacetime with Stuart Gary.com. The show's also broadcast coast to coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio, and as part of Virgin Australia's in flight entertainment. If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and other things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts or Audio Boom. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.